It is. We are so blessed. And a lot to be thankful. You know, not just during this time of year, during Thanksgiving. You know, being Thanksgiving weekend, you know, we often turn our attention to uh, being thankful. But let's not let, allow that time of year be the only time we're thankful. Right. Every day of our life, we have to wake up thankful. Thanking the Lord for what He's done for us. For who, simply because for who He is. Yeah. Simply for who He is. He's God. Yes. Amen. So John chapter 4. The book of John chapter 4 is where we're going to be tonight. Our account tonight will cover verses 1 through 42. I'm not going to read every uh, verse, so we'll read a few verses and then skip down a little bit. We'll cover this whole... Uh, this whole account. So John chapter 4. And we'll be uh, beginning in verse 1. It says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given given thee living water. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered, and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now drop down into verse 28. And the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And then uh, drop down to verse 40. It says, So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Father, I want to thank you so much for the privilege that we have to be in your house tonight and to hear from your word. Lord, help us never take for granted what you have given to us. Just the fact, Lord, that we're able to hold your word and open it and read it is a blessing. And I pray that you would speak tonight, speak to each of our hearts, and help us not to simply be hearers of the word, but to be doers and to apply it to our lives and And Father, I pray that you'd simply use me as your vessel uh, to get your word across uh, to the people here tonight. And we love you, Father, and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you notice on the video uh, there, we had much to do with water and a couple of the verses that we read tonight. we're there in the video dealing with water, and a lot of my a lot of the inspiration really from that was a couple years ago. I read a book called A Long Walk to Water. 
And it takes place in South Sudan. It's written by a South Sudanese man. And actually on our table we have the children's version of the book called Nya's Long Walk. Uh, but this book, A Long Walk to Water, is really a two-in-one story. It tells about this man in uh, around the 1980s. And then it tells about this young girl, roughly in the 2000s. And uh, so this... A uh, young man named Salva in the, around the 80s, he was a young boy at the time, and Sudan was still one country at the time. The South was fighting, there was civil war before South Sudan became its own nation. And during that time frame, uh, both the rebel soldiers as well as the government soldiers, it wasn't uncommon for them to force young boys into their army to fight. I'm talking about like eight years old, forcing them from their homes, training them how to use a machine gun, and training them how to kill. It wasn't uncommon. It was very common for both sides. And of course, as parents, a parent didn't want that for their child, for their son. They wanted a better life than that. And so many parents started to send their boys out into the African wilderness to go find a better life. It's better than soldiers coming and taking their son and knowing that they're going to die. So they sent them out into the, and they're into the open African wilderness to, find, to go to Ethiopia or to Kenya to find a better life. And you can even uh, look this up. They're called The Lost Boys of the Sudan. There's been documentaries. There's been several books and even movies uh, uh, written about them. And along the way, uh, it became a group of roughly 20,000, thousands of boys traveling. And they came to Ethiopia, and after a couple years in Ethiopia, they were forced to leave because of war there, and forced to go to Kenya. And you know, as you can imagine, this is African wilderness, and there's a lot of casualties along the way. Of course, they weren't sent out with food, they just have to find food. And of course, there's animals. <laughs> I think of the African animals, that, that's, that was there and soldiers along the way. But this uh, young boy, Salva, he was one that survived, was able to go to Kenya, and eventually found his way to America, found that better life that his parents wanted for him. And as he got older, he, he had a desire to, to go back, to help his people some way, to help the people of South Sudan. And he started thinking of ways that he could be a help to them. And there's need for education, uh, need for food, so many needs that the people had there. But one thing that really stuck out to him was the need for clean water, the need for water. And he thought about his own childhood, and uh, many young girls in that culture, they tr even as the video said, they'll travel six hours a day. They'll, they'll travel to go get water. They'll start early in the morning, go get water, bring it back, and then they'll do it again. And that's pretty much their life. They have to help provide for the family. All the family is all together and just trying to survive, just trying to live. And that's what the young girl, her story, Nya, her story was uh, basically that's what the story tells about her, how she every day without fail got up and went to go get water for her family. And where these two stories come together is Salva comes to her village and he drills a well. And he has a charity even to this day, has uh, roughly 200 villages now have been supplied with a well because of his work uh, over there and, and brought clean water to people. And now all these young girls, instead of having to travel every day, now they're able to go to school. You know, one thing that has stuck out to me about that story there's a couple tribes in South Sudan that uh, are the major tribes there, and a lot of the civil war that has taken place after South Sudan gained independence has been because of the Dinka tribe and the Nuer tribe. And so Salva, he was from one of those tribes, and this young girl, Nia, was from the other of those tribes. And what stuck out to me is that Salva, he had a desire to help all people. It wasn't just a certain people in South Sudan that he wanted to help. He came to this village of this enemy tribe. These two tribes have been fighting for centuries. But he came to their village and brought them water, clean water. 
you know, as we see here in John chapter 4, really see something similar. Because if you know much about the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't like each other. They didn't get along. As the Bible even says, the, the woman was surprised that Jesus was even talking to her. She said, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. They didn't like each other. They didn't get along. The Samaritans, they were basically half-breeds. They were Jews, part Jew, part Gentile. And so the Jews didn't like that. And they didn't, do, didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans. And so Jesus is traveling here from Judea to Galilee. So Judea is in the south. Then there's Galilee. And right in the middle, there's Samaria. And so the easiest way, the fastest way to go from Judea to Galilee would be to go right through Samaria. But many times, Jews would go around. They'd take the long way because they didn't even want to touch the ground that the Samaritans were on. But the Bible says there in verse 4 that he, talking about Jesus, he must needs go through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. He knew that there was a woman there. He knew that there was a city there that needed him. That needed him. He needed to go there. You know, when Jesus was on this earth, he was here to do his father's work. And he said, he said as much many times that he was here to do his father's work. And it was the Father's will for him to go through Samaria at this time. And that's where Jesus traveled. So he goes through Samaria, and you know, think about the disciples. So the disciples at this point in Jesus' ministry, it's early on in Jesus' ministry. Now we're not thinking about the disciples in the book of Acts, where they're telling everybody about Christ, and they are being persecuted. But the disciples here are still, still learning. They, they're still learning, still have a lot to learn. And I'm sure the disciples weren't thrilled to be going through Samaria, because again, they're Jews. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't want to go through Samaria. They didn't want to be there. But since Jesus was going through there, they went with them, and I'm sure also they wanted to get through there as fast as they could. They didn't want to stop. They didn't want to talk to anybody. But they come to this well, and Jesus is weird with his journey. And the disciples, I'm sure, are a little weary also, and they go to the city to buy some food. They go grocery shopping, go buy some food for their journey. And Jesus sits here on this well, and we see this Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman come to this well to get water. And then Jesus starts to have a conversation with her and says, give me to drink. And again, we see that this woman is surprised. She's taken aback. Why are you even talking to me? She knows that he's a Jew. So she's wondering why he's even talking to her. You know, Jesus was here to reach all people. Amen. He, he crossed some cultural boundaries. Jews usually didn't talk to Samaritans. They didn't have any dealings with Samaritans. But Jesus crossed that cultural boundary because she was a soul. Yeah. But also, another cultural boundary was men and women in that time didn't talk to each other in public. And so that was another one. So Jesus crossed a couple of cultural boundaries, but he knew that she needed the gospel. You know, we're living in a day and time where uh, our society almost makes it seem like it's wrong to cross those cultural boundaries. You know, as human beings, we're all of the same race. Yes, sir. We're all human race. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't matter what we look like. Yeah. We all have the same need. Yeah. We all need the Savior. We all need Christ, and we ought to be willing to cross those cultural boundaries. Yes, sir. No matter who a person is, no matter what language they speak, we need to do our part in trying to get the gospel to them, because that's what Jesus was here for. He was here to reach all people, not just the Jews, but to reach all people. And so he begins to have this conversation with this Samaritan woman, and he shows her he starts to show her that she has a need, that she has something missing in her life, that he has something that she needs, and that there's something different about him. Because he says, I have water. I have this water that you'll never have to come, that you'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. And now the woman is thinking physically. 
Okay, she says to Jesus, well, give me this water so I'll never have to come to this well again, never thirst again. And wouldn't that be amazing? Where you drink some water and you never thirst again. But we know Jesus wasn't talking physically. He's talking spiritually. But the woman didn't know that at this time. And so uh, you almost chuckle there in verse 12 where she says, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Because knowing the story, we know who Jesus is, that yes, he is greater than Jacob. But she's trying to figure out who this man is. How can he say that he has this water that shall never thirst again? And, you know, people need to know, just as Jesus was showing her, you know, I have something that you need. People need to know that you have something that they need. Yes, people need to know that they have a need. And as believers, we ought to live our lives in such a way that shows people that we have something that they don't have. We have something that they need. That's what Jesus is trying to get across to her here. It's kind of sparking her interest here. And then he goes into uh, showing her her sin, that she's a sinner, because he, he says to her, Go call thy husband and come hither. There in verse 16. Then the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said well, well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly. So Jesus knew who she was. He knew that she was a sinner. He wanted to, he wanted for her to admit that. And that's what people need. They need to know that they're a sinner. They need to admit that they're a sinner. And she realizes that there's something different about this man that I'm talking to. Because he knows who I am. And she says as much. She said, I perceive, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. She knew there was something different about this man. Something different about Jesus. And so when she realizes, okay, he, he's a prophet or, or something like that, then uh, she brings up this question about worship and says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. So the Samaritans, they worshipped in a mountain, Mount Gerizim. They worshipped God there. And the Jews, they believed you have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. And Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And Jesus is basically showing her that you don't have to go to some specific place to worship God. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go to this Mount Gerizim. And we see throughout our world, throughout our society, uh, many religion, religions in this world believe, oh, you have to go to this certain place. You have to go to the temple to worship God. You have to go to Mecca. You have to go here or there to truly worship God. You know, Jesus is showing her that God can be worshipped right where you're at. You can be worshipped in your own home. You know, you don't even have to come to church to worship God. God desires for you to worship Him every single day. Yeah. Now, church is very important. Christ died for His church. He started His church. So if He started the church, then it's important to Him. But you shouldn't just wait for Sunday or Wednesday to roll around to worship Him. To praise Him. You can do that in your own home. You can do that, that right where you're at, in your own closet. And then the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And again, another verse that uh, we who know the story might make you chuckle because she's talking to the Messiah. The very one that she's talking about, she's talking to. 
And then Jesus says, I that speak unto thee am he. You know, at that moment, the light came on in her life. In her mind, in her heart, she realized, this is the Messiah. The very one that I've been talking to. I knew there was something different about him. I've been talking to him. The Bible says that she, after the disciples came back, that she ran, she left her water pot, went her way into the city. So the disciples come back, and this woman, she drops her water pot, and she runs to the city. She wants to tell everybody, everybody that she can, hey, Jesus is here. The Messiah is right here, right outside the city. He's here. Come see him. He told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? So she was telling people. And during that time frame, while she's out, she's in the city telling people, the disciples have come back, and they've brought the food, and they tell Jesus, and they, well, they say, Master, eat. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And this makes the disciples confused. Has, has anyone else brought him food? And Jesus starts to tell, to teach them starts to bring them along a little bit and show them that they need to look upon the spiritual things, not just focus on the physical, the physical food. Because he says to them, there's a harvest. In those verses following, he says, the harvest is ripe. It's here. It's right now. Don't just, phys- don't, don't just focus on the physical But look at the spiritual needs of these people. The disciples had just gone into this city to buy food. And the Bible doesn't give any indication that they had told anybody. Now that kind of struck me. Why didn't the the disciples go into the city and tell the city, hey, Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. Why didn't they tell him? Because the disciples knew who Jesus was. They, they had professed that Jesus was the Christ. But why didn't they tell this people, this city of Samaria, why didn't they tell this people about Christ? Why did it have to be the Samaritan woman that went back and told the people and they came? Well, the disciples, you know, they were still learning and, and I believe this was, a, this, a, this particular time in their life was a, a failure on their part. Now we know in the book of Acts, that, I mean, they have boldness for Christ. They, they're even willing to give their life for the sake of the gospel. They're not, not only telling Samaritans, but also Gentiles. And they have a love for all people. But this specific time in, in Jesus' ministry, uh, they, I believe, still had a animosity towards the Samaritans. And they weren't thinking about the Samaritans as souls, as spiritual souls. And they just went about their day, their business, went to the grocery store to get what they needed, not even thinking about who was around them, not even thinking about the fact that the Savior, the Messiah, was right outside the city, and there's a people here that need to know him. But it took this Samaritan woman who met Jesus for the first time, and she went and told people. She went and told all that she could. But Jesus, again, he's helping his disciples along. He's showing them, hey, there's a harvest here. Look at these people as souls. And then the Bible says that the Samaritans came. They came out of the city, and they believed on him because of the saying of the woman, because of her testimony. And they even asked Jesus to stay two more days, and Jesus taught them. And later on there, we saw that After Jesus had been there even two more days, they said to the woman, Now we believe not simply because of thy saying, but because we have heard him ourselves. We've met Jesus ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Christ. We know that this is the Christ, that he's the Savior of the world. And many people turn to Christ because this one Samaritan woman went and and told people. She went and told people. She had a love for for his city. She wanted them to know, hey, the Christ is here. The Messiah is here. Now, I believe Jesus wanted his disciples 
to have done the same, though. No matter if they were Samaritans, they, they could have been Gentiles. Jesus wanted people to know. He wanted his disciples to tell all people, not just to focus on the Jews, but to reach out to all people, to see people as people, as souls. Because Jesus was here to bring the living water. He was here to bring the living water to people. You know, when Jesus, when Jesus told the uh, Samaritan woman, he said, I have water that you'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. You know, that really proves the fact that you never lose your salvation. Because if Jesus said, you never will thirst again, then if someone were to lose their salvation, wouldn't they thirst again? But Jesus himself said that you won't. And so once someone receives that living water, they never have to worry again. They never have to thirst again. They never have to drink of it again because they have it forever. They have it for a lifetime. Now, if I were to, we often get thirsty and, and uh, maybe running or, or doing physical activity and, or just living life. I mean, we get thirsty. And say I you know, was walking along the sidewalk and saw somebody that looked like they were about to pass out. They were thirsty. Maybe they were almost passing out of, of heat exha exhaustion. And I walked up to them and gave them an empty bottle of water. What would that do for them? They wouldn't do anything for them. They wouldn't quench their thirst. This wouldn't do anything for us, would it? We wouldn't quench our thirst. And you know what? That's what we can, we can allow all the religion of this world. Anything, any belief that is separate from the word of God and salvation, true salvation, that's what's represented. You know, there's a lot of belief out there. There's a lot of religion out there. But all they have is emptiness. All they have, is, it's like an empty bottle of water. And that's all they're giving people. All they're giving people is an empty bottle of water. If it's separate from uh, simple faith in Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins, then it's emptiness. If it has anything to do with works, anything to do with... Uh, Bapti baptism for salvation, anything else, you know, it's empty. And that's what people have. A lot of, too many people in this world, billions of people in this world, all they have is emptiness. All this religion is giving them emptiness. It's not giving them anything that will last. You know, as believers, this is what we have. You know, if I go down, again, down the street and see somebody who is thirsty and, and, and again, maybe sick and about to pass out, and I had several water bottles with me. I should give them one, right? I need to give them one to help them, to help quench their thirst. Now, again, this is physical water, and sure, they will thirst again with that physical water. But as believers, we have the spiritual water. We know where to get it. We know where to get that spiritual water. You know what? Our responsibility is to tell people where to, where to get it. Right. It's to tell people that Jesus Christ is the living water. If we walk by people and we have the living water and don't offer it to them, don't share it with them, then how cruel would that be? If I had several water bottles and I just walked by somebody who was thirsty, looked like they were going to pass out, I mean, that would be cruel, wouldn't it? Not to give them any water. Even so much more, us as believers, we have the spiritual water, the water of life, Amen. and we need to tell people where to get it. Yes, sir. We need to show people where they can get it. And it's only in this, this book. It's only in God's Word. It's only through Jesus Christ that they can get that spiritual yes, water. And there's billions upon billions of people in this world I think it was just maybe a week ago or so that the UN officially said that our world population has reached 8 billion people. 
Eight billion people. I can't even fathom that. Eight billion. A couple countries that have over a billion. And I think it's safe to say a majority of them have never heard about Jesus. A majority of those people don't have the water of life like we have. That's why we need to tell people. Everywhere we go, we need to tell people, listen, you don't have to go to South Sudan. You don't have to go to Kenya to find people who are thirsty, people who are in need of a Savior. You don't have to go there. And I know you know that. I mean, right here in Philadelphia, I mean, there's people all around here just in this neighborhood. And you know better than I would. There's people here that are thirsty. They're searching. They're searching for something to bring peace, searching for something to bring joy, to fill that void in their life. They're searching for, I mean, many people search through uh, drugs, alcohol, through just entertainment, through money. They search through all these things, but they can't find it anywhere. It's because it's only in God's word. It's only through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, if you're here tonight and you don't, you don't have Christ as your Savior, you don't know that you're saved, you've never put your faith and trust in Him, simply confessing your sins to Him. That's how easy it is. Salvation is simple. It's we as human beings that, that, that make it confusing. But salvation, God made it simple. Simply putting our faith in Christ, asking Him to forgive us of our sins. And He promised that He'll save us. He promised that for eternity and that you'll never lose it. you always have it. You'll never thirst again. If you've never done that, I, didn't, I would plea for you to come tonight and receive Him as your Savior. Receive him tonight because you don't know how long you're going to live. You could go walk out these doors and, and pass away tonight, pass from this life. But tonight is the night for salvation. Today is the day for salvation, right now. If you don't know him, trust him today. Jesus is offering you a living water. He didn't just offer it to this Samaritan woman. He's offering it to every single one of us. He's offering it to everyone in this world. He's offering us this living water. And you can have it. You must believe. You must turn to Him. And as believers, as believers, you know, no matter where God has you, there's people. There's people that are thirsty. People that are thirsty for the truth, looking for the truth in their life. It may be at your job, maybe at a restaurant, maybe your next door neighbor or a family member at a gas station. Just think about your daily life. Just as you go about your daily life, as, as, as human beings, we have physical needs. You know, the disciples, they have physical needs. And Jesus wasn't telling them that their physical needs weren't important. Because even Jesus, you know, he ate, he slept, he drank water. But he's, he was trying to get them to see that while you go about your daily life, your physical life, think about the spiritual. Think about the souls that are around you. So as you go about your daily life, whatever it might be, whatever you might do it on a daily basis, think about the people that are around you. Take tracks with you. Take the gospel with you. And tell people. Tell people their need for the Savior. When the church has organized visitation, a time specifically set aside to go out and knock doors, as was mentioned even tonight, and be here. Because as believers, that's why we're still here on this earth. You know what? Jesus could have taken us to heaven as soon as we got saved. God could have done that. But he left us here for a purpose. He left us here for a reason. And that's to share with others. That's to tell other people their need for the Savior. So during uh, about seven years of uh, 
our first seven years of marriage, I worked there at uh, O'Reilly Auto Parts, and and you know there's there were people there, there were people there, and God did a work in my heart to look at those people at at that job as a mission field, and it reminded me that I don't have to wait until I go to Kenya or to South Sudan to be on the mission field. There were people right there in that warehouse who needed the gospel. I mean, and there were people from many different cultures that I worked with. Many different countries were represented in that small little warehouse. But every single one of them had the same need. They had the same problem. They needed a savior, and they were sinners. And that goes for every single one of us. You can go anywhere in America and find lost people. You can go down the street and find lost people. There are people all around us that are thirsty. So let's do our part. Do our part as believers. Let's get the gospel out. Let's tell people. Let's share with people how they can have eternal life. How that they can be saved. And pray for people. Continue to pray for people. They may reject it. But continue to pray for them. Continue to get the gospel to them. Don't give up on them. Because the gospel does the work. We just need to do our part as believers in telling people. God does the rest of the work. God works in people's hearts. Let's do our part in getting the gospel out. Let's do our part in giving people the water. Let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's share it with others. Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. And thank you for how you... Thank you for how you've given us your word. And how you work through it. And again, I do pray, Father, that you'd help... Help each one of us... To look at people as souls. And not... Help us not to waste time, Lord, in getting the gospel out and telling people and and just in our daily physical lives as we go about our daily routines. Help us to look at people as souls and look for those opportunities to give people the gospel. And if there's anyone here tonight, Father, that does not know you as Savior, I pray that they would come tonight. They will trust in you and give their life to you. We do love you, Father. Thank you so much for your goodness, your grace to us. In Jesus' name, amen.